Toronto, Canada's largest city and one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And as the world faces huge environmental challenges, a collaborative approach is being called for to address our shared environmental problems at regional and global levels. And that's the transboundary theme of this year's annual meeting, Great Together, Separate Challenges and Collective Solutions. It's the SeaTac North America 40th Annual Meeting, and you're watching SeaTac TV. Welcome to the SeaTac North America 40th Annual Meeting. And we're delighted to be here in the heart of Toronto for this very special anniversary edition. Now, as scientists gather alongside representatives from industry, government and the non-profit sector to discuss the most pressing issues of the day, here at SeaTac TV, we'll be bringing you the very latest from the meeting and beyond. We'll be talking with keynote speakers, award winners and visiting organisations from around the world. Today, we'll be looking ahead to some of the meeting's highlights and discussing some of the big issues of the week. Plus, we'll explore one of SeaTac's key values of stimulating knowledge sharing as we join in with the community engagement event. First, though, I caught up with SeaTac president, Dr. Gertie Arts, to find out more about this very special 40th anniversary. Well, it might be hard to believe, but it's nearly 40 years to the day since the first SeaTac meeting was held in Arlington, Virginia. And here to talk about this really important anniversary, I'm delighted now to be joined by Dr. Gertie Arts, the SeaTac president. Gertie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your invitation. Well, first of all, many congratulations on the anniversary. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how it all began. Yeah, thank you for this question. Yes, it all began 40 years ago, like you mentioned. And you know, by that time, there was no platform where scientists could discuss from a scientific point of view envir environmental issues and come to solutions. So actually, the CTEC uh, organization by that time filled a void of this request. So CTEC provided a platform for biologists, ecologists, toxicologists, ecotoxicologists, to discuss environmental issues and come to solutions. And what would you say that CTAC has achieved over the last 40 years? What CTAC has achieved is that uh, the environmental issues and solutions became um, part of the politicians and society. So they created awareness of those issues. And what the key thing is of CTAC is it, it is a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder organization around science. So what we provide are solutions to environmental issues which are broader than normal provided by other societies. So that's what we can provide to the politi politics and uh, society. And how different would you say CTAC is now from how it was 40 years ago? It started 40 years ago in CTAC North America and by that time it raised already uh, interest from scientists all over the globe. And quickly it grew into a uh, global organization, first establishing CTEC Europe as a sister organization and then also other sister organizations in other continents until 2002 CTEC Global was established. This field seems more relevant today than ever. What do you think the future holds for CTEC? I think our field of our environmental um, toxicology and chemistry is very key to society nowadays and to politics. And you can see it around other topics in, the, in, in newspapers, on television. So we are very relevant at the moment and becoming more relevant in future. Gertie, thank you so much for joining us and have a great meeting. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. And we'll be bringing you more on the 40th anniversary in tomorrow's programme. Coming up next, though, we'll be finding out about the innovative approach that ICL Group is taking to reduce the footprint of flame retardants. But first, let's take a little quick look at the in-depth features that we'll be running all through the week here on SeaTac TV.
ICL is a global fertilizer and a specialty chemical company. It's one of the uh, largest flame retardant uh, producers. Uh, we make brominated uh, flame retardants, uh, phosphorus-based flame retardants, and inorganic flame retardants uh, based on magnesium. The primary source of minerals for ICL is from the Dead Sea. It's rich in minerals, so it's rich in bromine, and then we also make uh, derivatives based on bromine near the Dead Sea in Israel. Flame retardant chemicals are additives which you add to combustible materials. It can be a natural material like wood, paper, or to the plastics. And these chemicals, they prevent ignition of the combustible materials, or they help to limit spread of the fire. They use mostly in electronics, in building materials, in textiles, transportation. We're surrounded by materials which are very flammable, and we need to protect them. The values of developing sustainable products is important from the early stage, from the discovery stage, as we use these chemi green chemistry principles, uh, develop products that are more sustainable, environmentally friendly, and also processes that become sustainable and environmentally friendly. ICL's approach to dealing with materials like flame retardants is fairly unique in that they have not only constructed materials and taken, you know, some effort to look at the impacts of their products, but they've actually taken a, an umbrella approach at designing and developing tools and an infrastructure to help customers evaluate what of the, the product choices for different applications. And I find that very, very unique in the industry to be actually you know, reaching out to the customer and providing tools to help assess the different possibilities and different choices. The SAFER is a tool that takes into account all the health, safety and environmental properties of a product. And it also takes into account the exposure profile of the intended application. And what it seeks to do is to match up the exposure against the health, safety, environmental properties so you can select the most appropriate flame retardant. It takes into account the price, takes into account the properties that you require and make sure that the end consumer is protected and gets the most suitable product. From the green chemistry perspective, looking at the safer tool that ICL has, right now it is focused pretty much on the types of products that ICL sells. I see that general approach being applicable to a much broader industrial audience, and I hope that in the future we see ICL's you know, tools and methodologies find its way into different industry sectors, because I think it's a very, very useful approach. By developing new flame retardants, which are polymeric, big molecules by nature, or reactive molecules, which will react with the matrix where they stay, uh, we believe, strongly believe, that these molecules will stay where they are. They will not escape into the environment, and this will significantly decrease environmental footprint of flame retardants. ICL is working very hard toward low chemical uh, our environmental footprint and to provide sustainable products. So for example, we have a new uh, flame retardant Polyquel P100. It's a flame retardant for electronic applications. We can make that compound using solvent-free process. We cut the cost of this product and this product is also low in uh, chemical footprint. So I think this product is very beneficial to both uh, uh, our uh, producer and also uh, our customers. Yeah, at ICL we're very focused on the circular economy. Safer is just one part of what we're doing. In Europe we have a plant now which is actually recycling insulation foam and it's allowing the styrene to be recovered and to remake polystyrene and we recover the bromine and we can make other bromine compounds from that. If you make the right selection of flame retardants in your product, then they will be suitable to be recycled once, twice, three times as many as you need. And circular economy is undoubtedly the future for the plastics industry. The vision is to work across boundaries and develop products that are useful and also sustainable. 
From the perspective of a practicing chemist, ICL has a, a leadership role it's playing in flame retardants, specifically because of this the SAFER program that they've generated that helps customers evaluate different product options and weigh them against pluses and minuses in performance and safety. And I see that as having no peers in the industry for that kind of a program. It's becoming something of a growing tradition. The community engagement event fulfills one of SeaTac's key values to stimulate knowledge sharing. So let's go over to the event to find out more about the event itself and also the work of the Toronto Trash Team. So here we are at the site of the Donmouth Naturalisation and Portlands Flood Protection Project. The community engagement event is about to begin shortly, but I'm delighted to be joined by one of the organisers of the event, Sam Athey from the Toronto Trash Team. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about the work that the Toronto Trash Team has been doing here? Yeah, so one of our goals is to use uh, scientific research uh, to provide evidence-based solutions for addressing plastic pollution in the environment. And so one of our goals for this project is to um, determine the amount and types of plastic debris that we're seeing coming from the Don River into Lake Ontario and investigating how we can stop that plastic from entering the lake. So one of the projects that we were working on is doing regular boom audits. So a boom is a floating device that traps floating debris that's coming down the river. Um, it's stretched across the river mouth and essentially what we're doing is pulling all of that debris that is caught in the boom, including natural debris and plastics, and looking at what types of plastic we're seeing and how much to get an idea of what the problem plastics are. So what plastics are we seeing most often entering Lake Ontario? And then how can we design uh, solutions to address those specific types of plastics? Well Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Sounds like a fantastic project. I can see lots of people arriving for the community engagement event, so we're going to go over and find them. Thank you. We're really trying to find ways to engage better with communities. So Chelsea, you're from the Toronto Trash Team and one of the organisers of this event. Just Can you just give us a little bit of context uh, about the Donmouth Naturalisation Project? Sure. Yeah, so what they're doing is they're rebuilding the mouth of the Don River. So the Don River has historically had environmental issues and the Waterfront Toronto has been working really hard to remediate that. And so this project is an extra step to re-naturalise the mouth to make it more habitat uh, for wildlife, to make it a more fun place for people to come walk around, see nature, um, and to make it a cleaner river. And how important do you think um, this sort of community engagement event is? I think it's really important. So I mean here as part of SeaTac, right, we're here as environmental scientists just to learn about the field in general, but it's really important to get people out into the community to interact with the scientists to kind of learn why a project such as this is important. It's also really good to raise awareness, right? People know, they get excited about something coming into their community and to think about how they can also help protect the dawn in the future. So it's this nice uh, community engagement with the public and then also of course the scientists as well. And what kind of response have you had from the community? We have, you know, we are we were sold out. So we opened it up to 100 people on Eventbrite. I'm not quite sure how many are here. It's snowing a little bit outside, um, but we're thrilled at our turnout. I think it's very important indeed to engage people because I do think that the Toronto waterfront has been largely forgotten. A lot of people in Toronto think of lakes and north and because this is so industrial it's, um, it's been neglected. So I'm a great believer in community involvement and it's all part of the education and getting people on board. What a fantastic event and so great to see so many people from the Toronto community getting involved. Now as I make my way back to the warmth of the Convention Centre, let's find out how Procter & Gamble is putting innovation at the core of all that they do. Procter & Gamble has a long history of innovation. 
It serves about 5 billion consumers with personal care and consumer care products globally. We have a long, long history of innovation in the personal and care space. We've been working on animal alternatives since the 1970s. In the environmental safety area, this is a relatively new question, one that really began to form in its present shape around the 2000s. This is now a consumer need. It's a societal desire, and we've invested very, very significantly in trying to devise assays that can address these questions. Safety is at the heart of everything we do. Safety is really three parts. It's objective safety, it's perceived safety, and it's regulatory safety. And we do our best to make sure that we are advancing the science and that we're being transparent and we're being good communicators with the science so we can assure the public that we're doing our best and that we really understand the compounds and the risks associated with them. The consumer expect our products to be safe and we also must make them safe for the environment as well. P&G has a long and storied history in really advancing the field of environmental safety and risk assessment. And I've been drawn to really practical applications of trying to advance the science. We build the basic foundational science to advance this work. Procter & Gamble works with scientists from academia, across industry, and scientists with, within government as well. This so-called tripartite approach is fundamental to making progress in defining what safe means and the data behind making safety determinations. Over the years, my work with Procter & Gamble has been in a variety of areas. We started out in the mid-90s working on different experimental techniques and experimental designs to provide better testing for effluents and chemicals. And then through the 2000s, we've worked with PNG on better experimental designs, better tests. In the effort to be more sustainable and to reduce animal needs for testing, this is something that we all have to work with together. This isn't just something that PNG does on its own. This is a partnership with government, with academia, with other industries, in order to understand the science that's needed to replace animal tests. But we can't do this in a vacuum. We need to have our tripartite partnership in order to make sure that we are developing a robust environmental safety assessment and that what we are developing is something that everyone agrees is safe and is repeatable and is reliable. It doesn't mean a lot coming from just me. It means a lot more coming from our regulator partners and coming from our academic partners as well. We have always been interested in devising assays that are more informative than the ones that we presently use. And in animal alternatives research, this is no different. The fish embryo test, or FET, is an animal replacement assay. It uses developmental endpoints that are tied directly to whether the fish will survive later on as a juvenile in development. P&G uses alternative methods like the fish embryo toxicity test to understand the environmental hazard of compounds. We can use this test and the results from it in order to guide business development and make sure that we are moving towards a more sustainable and safe space. And we can also use this information in our product registration and environmental risk assessments. The future of animal alternative assays is actually very exciting. There are many things that are on the horizon that will improve what we can do for predicting environmental safety. With fish and animal alternatives, with people in Procter & Gamble and HESI and other organizations, really I think has done a lot to help the world understand how to do assessments and protect the environment in a ethical and meaningful way that provides safety and science-based decisions on how to do work in the environment. We're often um, sought after for our ability to partner with our analytical capabilities. People will think of P&G and say, I want to collaborate with P&G because they have world-class toxicologists and they have this incredible chemistry associates that they can work with as well. And they're just right down the hall from us. So when we're developing a test, I can have those conversations with chemists and then we can have the conversations from the testing side of things. And together we can work to build a phenomenal testing strategy that leads to robust data generation for our risk assessments. If not for CTAC and its tripartite relationships with government, academia, and industry, we would be in very different place than we are right now. 
My collaboration with partners in industry and in government have really helped the environment in meaningful ways. We can do so much more together than we can alone, and for sure, SeaTac has been an instrumental part of shaping environmental safety sciences today. We consider ourselves leaders in the field, and we continue to work to help shape the right ways to answer the most important questions. Well, it's time now to take our last look at some of the fantastic work that's been carried out around the world. Let's head over to Japan, where the Centre for Health and Environmental Risk Research is using state-of-the-art science to support the goal of sound health of the environment worldwide. The NIES is the leading institute of environmental science in Japan, and our center, uh, Center for Health and Environmental Risk Research, is in charge of uh, scientific research to help realize uh, safe and secure societies. The center conducts research on uh, development of advanced ecotoxicity testing, analytical chemistry for environmental monitoring, environmental fate analysis and modeling, and exposure and risk assessment. The center also conducts research on environmental health research field on the uh, impact of chemicals on the human health by toxicology and epidemiology. The center consists of uh, researchers from a variety of backgrounds. Those include chemistry, biology, mathematical sciences, environmental engineering, toxicology, and epidemiology. We developed a GIS-based uh, multimedia environmental fate model and that covers uh, whole Japan with verifying uh, geographical resolution. The model can simulate environmental level distribution of chemicals over Japan uh, in each river segment. The model is now a major tool of Japanese official uh, chemical risk assessment. My area of expertise is to develop environment fate models and emission estimation method for chemicals, including environment risk assessment based on these results. I developed the pesticide chemicals high resolution estimation method named PECREM. It is used for estimating spatially and temporary variable emissions of various party pesticides. We are also developing the grid catchment integrated environmental modeling system named GSIMS. The GSIMS model is a multimedia fate model. It was basically developed for simulating organic pollutants. It has multimedia compartments such as the atmosphere, the surface soil layer, river and lakes, sea, and sediment with high spatial resolution. Anyone can download this model together with a user interface tool and input dataset for whole Japan from our website. The model can show concentration maps and environmental concentration distributions, including these temporal trends for each medium. The importance of effective and efficient risk assessment is increasing because many new chemicals are produced day by day. It will be more important to grasp the environmental levels of each chemical in low cost. I think multimeter fate model like GCM's model and emission estimation method are key technologies to achieve this goal. We are working on the development of new testing methods for ecotoxicity of chemicals. Uh, one of them is a Meogurt method for uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and uh, uh, transgenerational impacts. My interest is in uh, ecotoxicity and ecological risk assessment of environmental contaminants such as pharmaceuticals, surfactants, and pesticides. We collaborated with the US EPA to develop Medaka Extended One Generation Reproduction Test, which was approved as OECD Test Guideline number 2450. This method takes almost six months but has the extremely high sensitivity to detect the maternal transfer of the chemical and reproductive effects. The flow-through system was built 
to maintain the concentration of the chemicals to conduct the long-term fish toxicity testing. All the instruments are made of stainless steel, glassware, and PTFE to avoid the background contamination by the plasticizers, which is suspected as endocrine disruptors. We have contributed to the chemical management in Japan, such as chemical substances control law by the supply of testing organisms, such as fishes, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. Another important achievement is the new introduction of comprehensive analytical schemes in variety of applications of environmental monitoring. I am conducting research on grasping hazardous chemical substances in the environment by integrating chemical analysis and bioassay. I also conduct research on environmental monitoring methods to be used when chemical substances leak during the disaster. AIQS, called AICS, stands for Automatic Identification and Quantification System. AICS enables the identification and semi-quantification of substances without the use of target standards by adjusting the GCMS conditions. In addition to about 1,000 substances, that can be measured at present. We are updating the database so that more substances can be measured. The molecularly imprinted polymers, MIP, we are developing, mimics nuclear receptor such as estrogen receptor. Once this MIP is completed, it will be possible to efficiently extract and purify estrogen receptor binding substances from environmental water. In parallel with this, we have just started the development of MIP that corrects silent hormone receptor binding substances. In the future, we hope to be able to build a system that can detect environmental changes and identify the environmental impact contaminants rapidly. We will pursue the upgrade of ecotoxicity testing methods and investigation on the environment using several assays. We will also continue working on bioinformatics to contribute to the development of AOP and IATA. Our center will try our major effort to establish innovative science that supports society for sound and safe use of chemicals in the world. Now this year's meeting is packed full of spotlight sessions, renowned keynote speakers, forums and much more. So here to help us navigate through a little of what this week has to offer, I'm delighted to be joined by the meeting co-chairs, Chris, Trudy and Nicole. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Welcome to Toronto. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Chris, maybe we could start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about the theme of, of the meeting? Sure, Sam. The uh, theme is Great Together. And so to encompass that theme, uh, we're interested in finding out how we can work together across North America to solve common environmental problems, things like the Great Lakes, uh, transport of contaminants to the Arctic, that sort of thing. And as part of that, we're going to have a panel discussion um, called Learning from Leaders, in which we'll have some uh, individuals from government agencies in the States, Canada, as well as Mexico, who will talk about those kinds of things. The other thing that we want to uh, bring into the discussion is uh, the views of our indigenous peoples. That'll be a first, I think, for CTAC. And so we will have a specific uh, spotlight session on collaboration between Western knowledge uh, as well as indigenous knowledge. So we're looking forward to that. And then we're going to have a plenary speaker, Henry Lickers, who's from the Akwesasne. First Nation who will, uh, he'll be great because he has lots of experience on uh, those types of issues, especially with the Great Lakes. And we'll be talking to Henry Lickers in the program later on in the right. week as well. Um, Nicole, maybe tell us a little bit about the scientific program. What are your sort of hot topics? 
Okay, uh, we're really excited about the program this year. We think uh, RPC put together a really great uh, program that highlights both emerging and legacy contaminants. Um, we have three sessions on PFAS and four sessions on microplastics that we really uh, were excited about. Uh, there are over 2,200 attendees at this conference and we think that the program that we put together really um, boosted attendance. It's um, certainly a, a lot to, to people to get their teeth into, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So Trudy, tell us a little bit about some of the events that we can look forward to. So some of the things that are really new and exciting for Toronto, uh, on Thursday we have a CTAC Connects, which is a new initiative, which involves bringing in non-government organizations and citizen science, group, science groups to have conversations with CTAC attendees about ways to engage with each other and make really good use of resources. And you're asking for people to join in with that? To tweet their, um, their stories, their good news stories about science, citizen science. Fantastic. How, Chris, would you say that the values of CTAC are being reflected in, in this meeting? Well, I mean, traditionally within CTAC, we've tried to engage uh, the government sector as well as the academic sector and the private sector. So I think we've done that. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities for um, those three sectors to work together. And, and in addition to that, the NGO sector is often fairly underrepresented at these meetings. And so CTAC Connects, again, is was our initiative to really try and bring that pillar uh, into light a little bit more. Great. And just finally, Nicole, maybe you could tell us, I've had a little chance to look around Toronto. It's a beautiful city. Why is it such a great host city for this event? Well, in Toronto, we really value our multiculturalism. So there's a lot of really great restaurants to visit. I think all of the attendees of SeaTac will take advantage of the entertainment and uh, food experiences that Toronto has to offer. Well, thank you all for joining us. I know you're really busy. Um, and we wish you all a really fantastic meeting. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks. Well, that brings us to the end of our first program from the SeaTac North America 40th Annual Meeting. And what a fantastic day it's been. But as we've just been hearing, there is still so much more to come. Tomorrow we'll be taking a look at science off the beaten path when we hear from author Kate Harris and we meet with scientists carrying out research in some wild locations. Plus, we'll be dropping in on the 40th anniversary Spotlight session. Make sure you join us then. Bye-bye. <laughs>